webinar series. Uh, for those of you that know and have been involved in this webinar series in the past, you know that we conduct this Executive Insights on Leadership webinar once a month, and we are extremely fortunate to have Peter Logothetis uh, join us today to provide his Executive Insights on leadership. Uh, again, welcome everyone. This is Tim Rischolte with the Academy, and it's great to be with you again this month and with another fantastic executive from which we'll be able to engage with here over the next 30 or 60 minutes, as well as learn from and apply his wisdom to our daily activities to make us better as leaders. And in the process of doing so, you know, we then make our teams better, and we make our organizations better, and the communities in which we serve better as well. So it's one of the reasons that we bring these executive insights to you every month and are happy to do this again this month today. Uh, as a reminder, for those of you that have uh, you know, been with us in the past, you know how these interviews work. Uh, I'll conduct uh, the interview with Peter. Um, uh, I've got some questions based on his background. I'll introduce him a little bit more formally here in just a few seconds. Uh, but I do encourage you to raise some questions as well. If you have a question, please use the chat box here in the WebEx uh, meeting forum. We will be monitoring that throughout the time that we have with Peter this morning, and we will raise those questions on your behalf. Or if you'd like, we can open up your microphone and you can ask the question directly to Peter yourself for a response. I should say uh, something too as we're uh, here kicking off the program and, and, and I'll move into the introduction of, of Peter. Uh, I'll say that Peter is joining us uh, from, you know, from where I sit you know, nearly half, uh, halfway around the, the, the globe. Peter is joining us from, uh, from Greece. Uh, and uh, we do know that there are some weather issues currently uh, in and around where Peter is at, where he's dialing in from. And I only bring that up just simply because if we do have some technical difficulties, I want you all to be aware that uh, we will, uh, if for some reason we lose connection with Peter or he loses connection with us, we will try to uh, get Peter back on the phone, but we really do appreciate his time and his, uh, his, his dedication to leadership development and uh, to our Professional Development Academy. Uh, you can see here the, the, the background that Peter has, and I will say Peter has been a long-term friend of the Academy. Since 2014, when we first launched this Academy, Peter was one of the first ones that we spoke with about the Professional Development Academy, about the content that we should be focusing on, because while Peter Peter does have a, a career in IT while at Allstate. He oversee, oversaw a team of uh, employees of 1,200 staff while he managed the, uh, the divisions, the three divisions in IT uh, there at, uh, at, 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 uh, as a senior VP and the group chief information officer while at Allstate. And, you know, so he understands, uh, you know, the importance of leadership development, not just the technical need for leadership skills at a, at a, you know, within an enterprise business, but also the soft skills, you know, the communication skills, the, the, the perspective and mindset skills that are needed to operate at the highest level uh, at an organization, and especially an enterprise organization at that. You know, in addition to, you know, his time at Allstate and now as, a, as the uh, president and CEO of his own management consulting firm, Peter Logo and Associates uh, LLC, uh, you know, he's also been in leadership development for a long time, not just mentoring individuals at Allstate and helping uh, leadership development programs at Allstate, but he does it outside of Allstate and outside of the enterprises within academics as well. You know, he has uh, taught more than 20 years at DePaul University, as well as other institutions, including uh, the Corporate Learning Solutions uh, Division at Lake Forest Graduate School of Management, uh, where he teaches uh, uh, graduate uh, programs, uh, courses uh, for that institution as well. So both in uh, the industry, you know, at the enterprise level, as well as in academics, uh, Peter has been providing leadership development for a long time, and we are certainly appreciative of it time today. Certainly glad and privileged to, to call Peter a friend. Uh, and, and Peter, it's great to have you with us uh, this morning. Uh, there's so many things I could talk about, Peter, regarding your background. Uh, I'm not going to just read off the script here uh, in terms of your background, but if there are things that you would like to share uh, about your background to, 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 to build some of the commentary and, 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 and color in some of the aspects, uh, I'll in, introduce you and invite you to do that along with a question. Uh, as we start this, and, and that is, Peter, as you think about 
your leadership and the leadership development that you provide, whether it was your time at Allstate, your time at DePaul, or at Lake Forest Graduate School, or elsewhere. Uh, as you think about leadership, you know, maybe it's a big question, but as you think about, you know, any best advice, best advice that you provide graduates coming out of the schools you, you, you work in, uh, individual advice that you provide uh, those that are on the IT side coming up through Allstate or el elsewhere, or maybe just personal advice. What's the best advice that you have when it comes to leadership and leadership development and being a leader uh, as we get started here in this program? And any other background you want to provide? And again, thank you, Peter, so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's indeed, Tim, an honor and a pleasure to be part of this forum and to be associated with PDA for so many years. Uh, I consider myself lucky to have this opportunity uh, to know the organization, to know the difference you guys are making for so many young leaders and others along the way who are continuing to develop their leadership skills. Because one of the things I learned in my entire career before retiring last year from Allstate is that leadership is a journey. It's not something that you go to school for a year or you read a book or you go to a seminar and you can call yourself an effective leader. Every day we all learn. To this day, uh, I, I still learn so many things. And you learn them from making a difference for others. To me, leadership is really adding value and making a difference for other people. It's not to show how much you know, it's not to show how much you have learned or what titles you have. If I can have an impact on a student at DePaul University or Lake Forest Graduate School of Management, if I can make a difference to the group that's participating today with a couple thoughts and ideas and learnings from my life, uh, that's really what it's all about. Uh, the minute someone thinks that uh, they cannot add value to others, then they should know that they're not into the leadership arena. Uh, and again, there, are, there have been many, many different definitions out there. Uh, to me, it's again, how you influence people. Uh, the chairman of uh, all states, uh, whenever it would come to leadership, would say, this is uh, an opportunity where you influence others to do things that probably they wouldn't have done on their own, either due to lack of experience, lack of know-how, and they needed somebody to really help them through that particular situation. Uh, what I also think uh, of leadership is something that has a forward movement that adds value to it, um, not something that is static or one-time deal. It has to continue to evolve and continue to add value, uh, whether it's with a customer, if, you know, your Amazon or any other Google or any other organization, if your PDA with participants like that, how are we adding value to your life every day? How are you better off because of us? How are you better off with someone that is influencing your life and career? Again, many ways to look at it. At the end of the day, I think the most powerful way to look at leadership is to see yourself as a role model because people tend to pay attention to what others do, not what they say. Uh, there is an expression that I use in my class many times that goes something along those lines, and this is not my own expression. I read it uh, in a leadership article many, many years ago that says, the thunder of your actions is so loud I cannot hear you preaching and your talk and everything else. So as a result, uh, we've got to be very mindful, whether it's with students, with subordinates, with family members. Anytime we're in a leadership situation, we need to be mindful that we are role models. People are watching. People are uh, emulating what we do. So very, very powerful way of influencing people by exhibiting the right behaviors, being positive, being enthusiastic, being professional. Uh, those are the kind of things that come to mind, Tim, when it comes to the leadership topic, at least at a high level. And we can certainly go into more detail 
and I can share some uh, experiences and stories for the remaining time that we have and based on the questions the participants have. Yeah, thanks so much, Peter. Uh, so appreciative of that perspective and, and a great reminder that, you know, we're always being watched and therefore always serving as a role model. You know, sometimes we may not want to be serving as a role model, but we always are serving as a role model because we are always being watched. There was a question that came in, you know, as you were talking about, uh, you, you know, defining leadership. One of the things you mentioned was uh, leadership is really how you influence people. And a question came in from a participant here today who said, I am responsible for leading a team without formal authority. Can you provide some perspectives and insights about how to influence without positional power? And so, leader, uh, you know, Peter, any thoughts regarding leadership um, in terms of influencing? How do you go about, what are the best ways and best advice you have when it comes to really helping to influence others when you don't necessarily have positional authority over other individuals that you're leading? Absolutely outstanding question because many times uh, as a chief information officer or other roles that I had along the line, uh, I would ask for something and it would happen very quickly, but you know, that was more the positional influence that I had. I also leveraged other type of influence. Uh, they had nothing to do with uh, the title of the position. But to the question, uh, the most powerful, uh, I think, leadership that can be exhibited is when you don't have authority over people. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that I have the perfect formula for everybody how to do it, but what I can tell you is how and when it worked for me. It worked for me when the people I was uh, serving at the time, even subordinates, I always saw myself in serving them and serving my company and serving my clients. It always worked for me when they could tell in a very authentic, this is very important. Authenticity, originality, all those things are so important in this thing of influencing. They could tell that there was one thing I was all about, how to help them, how to better their career, how to advance customer issues. The minute you make it about you, you lose that influence, whether you have the authority of somebody or not. It has to be something where the person says, now, all that Peter is thinking about is my career. How am I doing? How, what issues am I confronted with? How can he help me? And when those, again, are genuine and authentic type of efforts on the part of the leader, I guarantee you the people below you or around you will be influenced by that, will be attracted to you, will trust you, because the influence uh, has a key ingredient in it, which is, do I trust this person? Just like trusting a financial advisor or trusting your insurance guy or your banker or your, your father or your mother, it has to be with that ingredient in mind. And then titles and position power doesn't mean anything. In my experience, those were the ingredients that worked for me. Yeah, that's fantastic. I appreciate the perspective on trust and the need for that. You know, Peter, I've heard you talk in the past uh, quite a bit uh, about the difference between kind of, you know, hard skills and soft skills. And I know that, uh, you know, coming up through the ranks of IT, you know, there's very specific technical skills that you have to be mindful of, you've got to be expert in, you've got to be savvy about. Uh, but as you move up the organization in leadership, whether you're in IT, cybersecurity, HR, manufacturing, finance, every discipline has its own technical lingo, technical capabilities and competencies and, and, and discipline. Uh, but it is really the soft skills, the emotional IQ, as I've heard you talk about it in the past, that is really the essential of business success and leadership success. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, especially from an IT perspective, you know, how do you think about those soft skills? And maybe if you've got ideas and thoughts about how do you further develop 
those soft skills to be expert at influence and about mindset and about communication and negotiation. You know, any thoughts or ideas or tips or tricks as you've moved up through the leadership ranks at Allstate uh, that really enabled you to, to uh, practice those soft skills to become expert with those soft skills to, to make you more effective as a leader? Absolutely, because if IT leaders talk the IT lingo, and God knows we have so many acronyms and stuff, whether it's in cybersecurity, in architecture, data analytics, if whether you're talking to the board of directors or other people in the organization, your business partners, and you're trying to talk about the technical aspects or even trying to impress them with your extensive knowledge of a specific area, yes, you will be respected for that. Those are table stakes. But the kind of things that really make you advance your career, make you be respected, is the soft skill. Communication. When you communicate, do you show empathy? Do you show understanding of the person's problem that you're trying to solve? Do you try to be authentic, as I said earlier? Furthermore, uh, and I know some people may disagree with this, but there has been a lot of research that says people sometimes that do very well are people that are well-liked by others. Uh, whether it's true or not, as I said, we can debate another day, but in my experience, I know that uh, that plays a key role. Uh, just to be liked is not enough. As I said, you have to be competent, you have to be experienced, but if on the top of it, you are well-liked, well-respected, you treat people uh, you know, the, the, the way you want to treat yourself, it makes a huge difference. If I may, I'll give you a real-life situation, a real-life story, because I think sometimes stories can be more powerful than statements or, or recommendations. When I was up again, another very tough competitor for a CIO opportunity, it was down. I was lucky enough to be one of two people to be selected for this important CIO job. And naturally, was critical to me was my first opportunity to be a CIO. And I knew the, the stakes were high. So I tried to be authentic. I tried to exhibit during the interviews my knowledge, what I would do for the company, my vision for improving the leadership abilities of people and, and all the good stuff that every good leader brings up during the process. Well, when the whole thing was over with, uh, and I was lucky enough to be selected, uh, the president of the company, who was my boss, and I had a very informal lunch in the cafeteria a couple months later. And I said, John, now that we got to know each other a little more, can you tell what made you guys select me rather than the other guy? By the way, I happen to know who he was, and I know he was a top notch as they come, even more technical in IT than me. And he says, Peter, it's the way you were perceived by my assistant, my executive assistant, my your peers, and everybody else from the moment you walked in the door. You walked in with a smile, with a positive attitude. You said hello to the assistant. You asked her how her day was. Uh, same thing with everybody else. You treated people with respect. You didn't come in in your high horse thinking that you know everything and you're a big child ready for this position. The other gentleman uh, was just as competent, if not more, but he just said hello and sat down and was reading a magazine the whole time. As he was walking through the hallway, he saw people and didn't even say hello to them. I mean, sometimes those little things, the signals we send across, and I'm convinced everybody that I got the job because of the soft skills they naturally or authentically came out because that's who I am. And I think if I had not shown that, they would have selected the other guy as the CIO and I would have been prevented from a good career opportunity. Real life story. Yeah, that's a great story and a great example of the need for, you know, just a care and concern for people and a, uh, you know, and, and, and just a, a positive mindset 
around, you know, what shows up when you do, you know, how are you going to show up, and, uh, and, and just engaging with people. And, you know, it's a great story regarding that emotional IQ that I've heard you talk about, about in the past. So thank you for that. You know, something else that came in here, Peter, was uh, a comment that you made earlier about uh, forward momentum. You had indicated that leadership, uh, great leadership, is really always about forward momentum, which uh, per the, the comment that is here, that's being equated into really focusing on change. And so the question is, as you think about forward momentum, uh, not everyone will think about forward momentum in the same way, yet as a leader, you have to plan, execute, and sustain change for organizations in order to survive and, and thrive. Can you talk a little bit about how best to do that? Because change is hard, we all know that, and the question is here, how have you in the past and, and currently, how do you think about organizational change and how do you overcome the challenges of change to better plan, execute, and sustain positive change, whether it be for Allstate or other organizations? Yeah, outstanding question, Tim. And again, yeah, I, I do, believe very strongly that in order to show true leadership and in order to make the difference for others, it has to be a formula, an approach, a technique, a plan that takes things forward. We all use uh, 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 sports and sports-related uh, analogies or examples. Think of a football game. Yes, you can exhibit forward movement by advancing the ball and having downs and so forth. But on the other hand, you get to the uh, one-yard line and you get intercepted and your opponent takes the ball and scores the other way. Yes, you exhibited leadership, but you didn't complete the job. You didn't go all the way. You didn't have the right execution and plan. So what, what it really means is to have, uh, as you said, Tim, the right strategy, the right approach. You obviously need the ability to adjust along the way because good leaders can assess, can detect either troubles as the plan is underway, uh, changing conditions, whether it's in the economy, as a merger comes in and changes the whole game plan. Uh, in that particular CIO job that I talked about earlier, uh, within six years that I worked there, we had five mergers. The best plans we had about projects and architecture were changing every six months when the company and the board of directors were acquiring new business. So the whole idea of adjusting along the way, having the flexibility, the agility, uh, back to the influence, the influence to have your team follow you even though there will be some really tense moments and insecure moments for some people thinking they may even lose their job. But if you do it again, we're always looking forward, always being aware of adjusting conditions and keep focus on that scoring the touchdown, knowing where the direction is and not deviating from there, you will get there. Uh, People, 99% of the time, when they have visions and plans and flexibility and top talent to follow you, you will get there even if you run into some situations along the way. I'm, that's what I have seen in my entire career, watching people and organizations and others execute well and reach fantastic goals for themselves, for their teams and their companies. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Another question that came in, uh, you know, uh, goes back to an earlier comment you made that uh, th this person must be in IT as well because they said we, per your comment, Peter, we certainly do have our own language in IT and it can get in the way sometimes. Uh, the question that this person has is, as you think about Allstate or anywhere else, as you move up the organization, you obviously have to become more and more knowledge about the enterprise and how the business functions. Can you share any story or advice for a young leader as I think about how to move up the organization knowing that I have to understand the business, not just IT, but the business? What are some, some ways in which I can best do that? Absolutely, and again, uh, 
Uh, I'll share a couple of quick stories from real life situations at all state and house where they had allowed me to perhaps reach some of those uh, goals easier and stay away from the technical legal and more importantly build the trust with my business partners. When I started all state, I was the CIO, it was called divisional CIO for the claims department. I didn't have any experience in claims before. I had a lot of experience in IT and in other insurance companies, but every organization is different. So what I decided to do is I decided for the first time to spend quite a bit of time with my IT organization, obviously getting to know them, let them know what I'm about, getting their input, find out critical issues and help them with. But I spent for the first three months, I would say over 60% of the time in the business department, I asked for a, for a, a desk, uh, an empty desk in the middle of the claims department, and I would go there for the first three hours each day, and then I would talk to colleagues, I would walk around, I would go to some of the meetings they had. Furthermore, I got some of the business partners to take me for ride alongs uh, in different parts of the country. For example, they would visit claims offices in Seattle, in uh, uh, New York, in other parts, and I would follow an adjuster when he would go to a body shop and handle a claim situation, a car that was completely destroyed. How do you find the value? How do you fix it or replacement? And that whole time, I was like a sponge learning all about this business side to the point where many times I would talk about claims business to my superiors and they said, Peter, I thought you told us you don't have any claims background. And I said, I'm just learning a lot in the last three months. Furthermore, when we were asked to go to the executive committee for next year's budget, my counterpart from claims and I did something special which worked out very well for us because we had an outstanding trust and, and working relationship. We said, you know what, why don't you, Peter, present the claims business strategy and Sean, who was my claims uh, VP, my partner, he said, I'll present the IT side of things so we can get several million dollars of new budget for the following year. The executive committee was so pleasant guys that all Peter talked about was claims handling, how to make life easy for our customers and the body shops and what capabilities we needed. I didn't use any IT acronyms whatsoever, no IT projects. Then came Sean and said, in order to do all those things for our customers and the departments that Peter talked about, we need this kind of technology projects, budget to make it happen. Uh, it, it was just, you know, something special for me to go through it. From that point on, and for the subsequent six years at Allstate, many people thought I was from the claims department. That's how you gain that credibility and stay away from the technical jargon. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you got a couple comments in the chat box to, saying thank you for uh, for the perspective, especially noting that you had, you you knew enough that you had put 60% of your time there, and so that that level of specificity is really helpful. There's a couple other questions here. Uh, you, you know, one. Uh, 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 I think they're all fun questions, but one especially fun that pertains to Greece. And then uh, another one that really uh, adds on to the conversation you just had about going to Seattle and going to New York and going elsewhere. Uh, this person is responsible for a global team and is interested in your insights on, a, a, on, on managing and leading a global team. Uh, but before we get to the global team question, there is a question here about Greece, and it's, uh, it's a recognition of thank you, Peter, for, uh, for, for, for calling in while you're in Greece. Um, it, can you tell us a little bit about what makes Greece so special? Uh, and it, this person says, I've never been to Greece, but I've always wanted to go. Uh, can you tell me something about Greece that I may not know about from having read it in books and elsewhere? What, what makes Greece so great? I look forward to being there someday. Sure, I'll be glad to cover this, and I agree. It's a fun question in the middle of some more uh, business, uh, more sophisticated discussion we're having. Uh, for the people uh, that are not aware, I know that Tim and 
some of my partners from professional development care that are aware of it, but I was born and raised in this small village in Greece, in south part of Greece, where by coincidence, I'm taking this call today. I'm here with my wife for a three-week vacation, and I came to the States when I was 16 years old. I didn't speak a word of the English language. I, uh, they put me in the middle of high school, and people thought for a while that I wasn't saying a single word, that I was deaf or something. I feel a few months down the line where I started speaking and writing, Eventually, I was able to uh, overcome the language issue and finish high school, go on to college, fortunate enough to get my MBA, and then go on to teaching and the rest of my career. So, certainly, Greece, for me personally, has that emotional uh, history to it. And going back to one's roots helps them stay humble. Uh, in this particular home where we grew up, there was no electricity, there was no running water, no kitchen, no bathroom. Those were the conditions uh, that I uh, remember. So whenever I come back, it reminds me that, Peter, no matter what titles you earned along the way or what compensation you got, you're still a simple guy from a little town in Greece where people respect each other and love each other. Now, the other side of Greece, for those of you that are thinking of visiting, and I have visited many other parts of the world because I think by us visiting different countries and cultures, we become better people. We understand and empathize with other people. I've been to India where I had a thousand people report to me from there, Belfast, Ireland, and of course, across the United States and been in other parts of the world. So it doesn't matter at the end of the day whether your destination is Greece or Spain or Italy or India. If you go to have some fun, that would be fantastic. But also my advice would be go and learn the culture, learn about the people, talk to the uh, little guy uh, in a coffee shop with a smile in his face and ask him the best you can communicate with him. You know, how are things going? How was your day? That's how you're going to really, uh, you know, improve even your leadership skills and, and, and understand people. But yet again, uh, Greece, like any other country, has a lot of beautiful places, a lot of historic places, from the Parthenon, who was the Olympic Games, Southern Olympia, to the beautiful Greek islands. But Italy, Spain, France, I think most of them have so much to offer. So it's not where you go necessarily, but why you're going there. And don't go just to visit a place and go back and take some pictures. Immerse yourself in all these things that I talked about, and you'll see that you'll come back a better person, a different person, a changed person. Yeah, it's so great. Thank you so much, Peter, for uh, for the insight into you. Uh, into who you are and, and how you uh, became the leader that you are. Uh, back to the global question, the, the question from this individual, and it sounds like they're, they're probably early in their career and, and new to managing people on a, on a global scale. It sounds like they really do have a global team. Uh, do you have, Peter, thoughts and ideas as to how best to manage your time on a global team because the, the person goes on to say it's incredibly challenging to manage a global team across multiple time zones and to really get to know people at a personal level rather than just getting the work done. Uh, it, are there ways in which to more intentionally uh, reach out to people and work with people on a global scale or a distributed team scale? Fantastic question very real question because as we know we live in a global economy most companies one way or another have a global presence although all state insurance as a business only does business in the u.s the it department which was about seven thousand people strong uh had about one third of those people in uh india uh one this is not offshore resources this were all state employees in India, and one-third in Belfast, Ireland. So naturally, for my organization, which I had about 3,000 people out of the 7,000, they were across the U.S. and in those locations. I use the same formula 
for leadership and effectiveness and running their organization across the globe. As I stated earlier in dealing with claims, business people, going to body shops, if you try to manage uh, remotely, if you try to do it through emails or conference calls, you probably will have 10% level of effectiveness and 10% level of effective leadership. you got to allocate a good part of your time, and this time I'm not going to say 50% or 60 each of you have to make the call, but I would go to Belfast Island twice a year, I would stay there for a few weeks, I would go to uh, Bangalore, India, uh, and other Mumbai and other places down there where we had employees, I would go out to lunch with them, we'll have town hall meetings, we'll have uh, small group meetings, one-on-one -on -one discussions, and you need to do it over and over and over again. Uh, I even uh, locked out uh, with a driver that they assigned to me down there uh, when I was in India. And he and I, you know, hit it off so well to the point where, you know, he writes me a note on my birthday and he says, Peter, when can you come back? You had such a positive influence on all of us. It's building those relationships because you're not going to be there. You can't tell 3,000 people or 30 people what to do in different cultures, different time zones. If you're just a voice they hear, if you're just someone with a title behind emails, uh, allow me to say very bluntly, you're going to fail as a leader in that global scene. You've got to know the people. You've got to understand where they're about. You've got to talk their language. You've got to talk to them on a regular basis. Uh, it, it takes that entire set of things that I outlined for you to have, again, back to the early discussion that we had, to have the influence, you need to manage global organization. At least that's what worked for me, guys. Yeah, thank you for that, Peter. Uh, a couple other questions here. Uh, one uh, starts off with a very simple question and, and and then adds in some additional subsequent questions. And the first question was, did you always know that you wanted to be a CIO? And then the subsequent questions from that were, are, I mean, are if you were always focused on becoming a CIO, uh, what was the career projection and how did you navigate that? And if you didn't move all the way up through Allstate, would you have left Allstate to become a CIO at another organization? Excellent question. I was lucky enough that during my high school years, while I was learning the language and adjusting to the American culture and all that, uh, my math class back then, I know a lot of you on the farm probably too young to remember this, but back in those days, they wouldn't have the fancy uh, computers and, uh, uh, and iPads and, and iPhones. Uh, basically, we had what they call back then teletypes. Uh, devices like that, and we learned Fortran programming, basic programs, some of the early easy languages to use, to learn. And when I was told by my math teacher that this allows us to communicate with computers, which is really the future for the business and society and stuff, I said, oh my God, what a perfect timing uh, to get into something you know, new and different. So I knew I was going to get into technology of some kind. I would be, you know, just honest in saying that I knew I wanted to be a CIO. I didn't even understand back then what that career was about and what the different titles. All I knew was that I want to be in the IT field and follow an IT career. And what helped me along the way to get to this point was mentors. I strongly want to take advantage of this opportunity and recommend to all of you that you have at least two to three mentors for your entire life, entire career. One mentor that is from your company, not your boss. One mentor who's from maybe an ex-professor or somebody like that. And a third mentor will help you more with the balance of life and other things, perhaps a good friend, somebody from a different field. There's mentors along the way and bosses that I followed as they moved around from company to company were the ones that then helped me, uh, you know, figure out what the ultimate destination was. I have students in my class at DePaul, computer science students, where the third 
year of the undergraduate program, they're still not sure what they want to do. So I recognize that sometimes we have so many interests and so many talents that we don't know which way to go. And like anything else, when we're in the forest of all those decisions, situations, the way to know how to navigate through that is to ask for help. And don't hesitate to people love helping others. And I helped others along the way. So, and then go with your instincts, go with your gut. You need to do something that you're very passionate about. Don't do something because it pays a lot of money. Don't do something because your father or brother or sister did it or a friend. You got to ask yourself. You got to look inside and say, what what is really my calling? What is really the thing that gives me the highest energy anytime I think about it? And it has been proven that if we follow those dreams, if we follow those directions that our instincts feel, you're not only going to be happy, but you're also going to be successful. Now, you may be CIO in IT, you may be CFO in finance or chief marketing or whatever the destination is. It starts with a first step and it starts with navigating with help from mentors along the way. Yeah, that's great, and actually is a great lead into the the next question. And uh, I'm just looking through the chat box here, and uh, for those messages coming to us. And this is the last question that I see in the chat box. So just as a quick reminder to to everybody, if anyone does have a question uh, that you'd like for me to ask uh, on your behalf, feel free to use the chat box, and and we will certainly pose that question to Peter. But Peter, you were just talking about navigating uh, with uh, mentors. You know, the 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 mentor within your company, the mentor that might have been a professor uh, that you. Uh, are familiar with and, and the mentor that is a close friend that can help balance uh, the, the, the challenges and complexity of life. Uh, th it dovetails greatly uh, with this question that is coming in now and the question is one of, uh, of intentionally managing relationships. The question is, uh, as you think about the roles that you've played throughout your career, are there, how did you go about building relationships? You know, did you, once you knew you wanted to be in technology, did you start immediately thinking about and seeking out CIOs to connect with, or was it more people that are around you? So the question is about managing relationships. How did you go about establishing the mentorship and establishing relationships and then leveraging those relationships for life and career? Absolutely. Another outstanding question. Uh, I. As an advice to the group, uh, do not concentrate only on superiors, those that are already CIOs and all that. Take every encounter with every person as somebody who can make a difference for you along the way. And build the relationship because treat them with the utmost respect and, and, and utmost empathy you have. I can tell you, students of mine, uh, after the quarter would be over at DePaul University, would know that I've been with a company for about 10 years, and I would share with them that I'm thinking right now of maybe considering a change. Several of my students work for different companies. They on their own, I mean, they got my okay, but they on their own will go and talk to their CIO and they'll say, hey, you know what, my professor at DePaul seems like a neat guy, do you have any opportunities in our company for him? He would be a fantastic guy to have. And, and many times I would get phone calls from search firms or a particular CIO saying, hey, you know, one of our employees who was in your class keeps bugging me every day <laughs> to follow up with you and to see if you want to come over to our company. Uh, again, treating every situation with the right trick. My dentist back then, I remember, you know, again, very good relationship that we built. And she would say to me, hey, Peter, you know, one of my uh, uh, patients here who came by the other day, he's the president of this particular company, and he's looking for some good leaders. And because I like the way you behave, the way you conduct yourself, even coming for a dentist appointment, would you like me to make an introduction with him? And before you know it, I will add to my contact list a president of a company who may have been interested in me. So 
do not think only in business terms, only of superiors and professors. You, you, you're not going to believe how every person can make a difference for you out there from a dentist uh, to a lawyer to a doctor to a, you know, a, a student. It all comes down to how you build those relationships with every person. If you exclude some people because you think they're not that important or that it's your, the profile you were looking for, you will be preventing yourself from possibly opening doors for yourself. So treat every relationship as though it's the best relationship, the most important relationship you can build with somebody. And so many doors will be opening for you. So many support people will be there for you. When people look for references, you can have on your list people from all walks of life. It shows that you're not just concentrating uh, on business people, but multiple people in our world and our society. So those were some of the things that worked for me. That's great. Thank you. And another question that just came in is about the evolution of leadership. And so as you just mentioned, Peter, there might be some things that will, will stand the test of time when it comes to leadership. Relationships are certainly important. How you go about those relationships might change with the uh, you know, advancements of technology and so forth. But as you've already mentioned, some things don't, you know, cannot beat being face-to-face -face and working with people and sitting with people and dining with people. Uh, but the question specifically is, as you think about leadership, how do you see leadership evolving over the next 10 or maybe even 20 years or, or, or more? What's the evolution of leadership look like to you? Absolutely. As much as technological advances are happening before our eyes and they're happening in such fast pace, certainly in the insurance industry, the thing that everybody has been preoccupied with will be driverless cars. Well, if cars don't need a driver, then you don't need insurance. If you don't need insurance, there are no insurance companies. So you can imagine how profound those changes are going to be across our world. Uh, you know, with robots and artificial intelligence and all that. But guys, I will tell you something, and you can take this to the bank. I feel very confident about it. No matter what advances I have seen in my entire 40-year career, the one thing that has always been at the center of everything has been the people side. Uh, I did my dissertation uh, when I did my MBA, and I call it the people side of system. Yes, software, hardware, cybersecurity, analytics, all that stuff will have that profound impact, but everything comes back to having the right people to drive those, to lead those, to leverage them for the good of the company. I continue to attend CIO conferences uh, even after retiring last year. I attend about maybe 10 each year. And I even can recollect from the ones I did in the last two or three months, when we have surveys of 100 plus CIOs that attend those conferences and say to them, what is the number one item that keeps you up at night? Before you get the results, you would think, well, cybersecurity or analytics or mergers or acquisitions or reduction in force. Everybody comes back with their number one item that keeps them up at night, shortage of talent, shortage of leadership. In the entire United States, there are only 1,400 people that are true artificial intelligence engineers. And think how many companies we have in the United States who are trying to transform themselves through AI and related stuff. Well, it all comes back to people, and there's such shortage of talent, such shortage of leadership, no matter how many years we want to look ahead, leadership and people will continue to be the glue that brings all those other advances together. I am convinced about this beyond any doubt from a historical perspective, from everything I see in the future, from talking to colleagues as recently as the last two months. It's all about people. So the stronger you are, the better you are with relationships and leadership influence. All the technology that will come in your way, you'll be able to leverage it and make the biggest difference for your company. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Peter. It is just a great uh, reminder. It's a great perspective and insight uh, that it is all about people. It, it is great and, and certainly needed to have the technical uh, mindset and technical capability of our teams in IT and, 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 and HR and manufacturing and operations and finance but uh, true leadership does come down to people, and it's all about the people, and your perspective on that is just fantastic, and, and you uh, kind of illustrate that through your actions of the conferences you attend and the, the, the leadership you bring forth in your classes as well as within the industry uh, that you serve uh, while your time at Allstate and now since that with other organizations you consult with every day. And it is just a great reminder for all of us that it is about the people and we build that uh, based on the intentionality that we have and the roles that we play, whether we're a project manager uh, in healthcare or if we're a program director in IT for some uh, insurance company, or if we're an executive uh, at any organization around the globe. Uh, it's the way in which we go about our business uh, that reflects our success, and the way in which we go about our business success is really determined based on the way in which we work with people. And so I really appreciate the perspective and the stories that you share. It's great, I think, to end on this. I'm looking at the chat box. I don't see any additional questions, but the focus on people really echoes your earlier comments and stories about why you were hired as a CIO in the first place. You spent time with the executive assistant and the receptionist and the people that are greeting you within the, the organization rather than sitting down in the lobby and looking at a magazine. Uh, you engage with the people as you walked around the office and you go around the globe and you meet with people and you learn about them and their families and their culture because you are you know, genuinely curious about them and about the business and about the cultures around the globe. And, you know, Peter, on behalf of the folks here at the Academy, we can't thank you enough for the support that you've provided us, the great uh, time and investment that you've given us to, to provide insights and wisdom uh, for our uh, Academy attendees as well as their supervising managers uh, who have been on the call today. We just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you, especially for taking time away from your family and friends while you're in Greece, uh, taking some time off to, to rejuvenate uh, in your hometown. Uh, so it's been a fantastic executive insight on leadership. Uh, wanted to say thank you again to Peter Logothetis for joining us. Want to say thank you for all of you attending, all of our Academy participants, as well as supervising managers of the Academy. Uh, it's our privilege and, and pleasure to provide this webinar series to you. Uh, coming up next is Joanna Berkeley. Joanna is the Global Head of uh, Cybersecurity and Defense at Siemens and she will be providing executive insights on leadership in August. Uh, and the website has been provided here in the chat box for you. Feel free to click on that link and load that into your calendar from there. We hope that you'll join us again uh, when Joanna Berkeley uh, speaks at our next Executive Insights on Leadership. Again, Peter, thank you so much, my friend. It's so great to have you part of our Executive Insight on Leadership webinar series. And we hope that you and your wife have a fantastic time while you uh, stay in Greece for a little bit while longer before you, uh, you head back to the United States. So, Peter, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we wish everyone a wonderful Tuesday, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you, everybody. Take care.